Hi, this is The Philosophical Angle, defining concepts in current media. I am your host, Chris Angle. I am the author of four books on philosophy, one of which is The Philosophical Equations of Economics. These books are available free for viewing at www.philosophypublishing.com. Along with me are our panelists, Mark Brennan, professor at the Stern School of Business, New York University. He is also the American editor of the Quarterly Review of London, England, established 1809. Welcome, Mark. Thanks, Chris. Also with us is Rick Samuelson. Rick graduated from Yale, has an MBA from Wharton and an MA from Tufts. He is also a retired head of securities, UBS Japan. The purpose, welcome, welcome Rick. The purpose of the philosophical angle is to examine the nature of the concepts being used in current media and compare the essence of the concept with the usage and circumstances in which the term is being used. The format to the philosophical angle is that your host will bring forth an opening statement on the nature of the concept for your consideration in our panel will react with their criticisms, their questions, and their own definitions. This week, <clears throat> we have a special edition of the Philosophical Angle. We take note of worldly or international predicaments of moment to the United States and render this to our panel and to our listening audience by posing the great conundrum what would you do were you the president? And so we commence with the subject of this week's issue, which is the problem of Iran. As everybody knows, Iran is developing nuclear weapons. But, of course, many countries throughout the world have nuclear weapons. However, Iran presents a problem. It combines this development of a nuclear arsenal with aggressive, vitriolic statements about Israel, the U.S., and the free world. Further, it is a totalitarian theocracy. The philosophical angle will state that demonstrably non-democratic totalitarian regimes have a greater penchant to generate atrocities both within their societies and without. History is full of examples. Just in the 20th century, there was, there was Stalin, Mao, Hitler, Pol Pot, amongst others. Of Castro. course- Castro. Pardon me? Fidel Castro, you forgot my favorite. Forgot Fidel. Of course, democratic states have also committed cruel acts of aggression, but they are minuscule when compared to those of the non-democratic societies. Hence, a concern among many nations throughout the world arises in that it would be a dangerous situation to permit Iran to become a nuclear state. Should we allow it? Were you the president? What would you do? The philosophical advocates the following. It is an ethical necessity to dismantle Iran's nuclear program, and it is also ethically requisite to help the Iranian people overturn the present regime, giving its citizenry a chance to create a democratic republic. What did you say? How could we say that it is an ethical necessity? Let's go to our definition of ethics. Ethics is the appropriate dispensation of respect. For example, when you give your parents their due respect, you are being ethical to your parents. We are respectful to others because we consider them important if somebody is important, it is because we want to cooperate with them to effect a result, that is, to produce something. 
We produce things and actions, that is, products and services, in order to bring ourselves up away from misery. And bringing ourselves up away from misery is the essence of that which is good. Okay, that said, why is it an ethical necessity to cause a, sens a cessation of Iran's nuclear program? Here's why. Iran is not a cooperative member with the U.S., nor any of its democratic republic allies. Iran makes vitriolic, imprecatory statements towards the U.S. and its allies, which include countries that are neighbors of Iran. Iran exhibits aggressive, insulting actions, such as the attempted assassination of the Saudi statesman on U.S. soil. Clearly, Iran does not extend the appropriate amount of respect to the international community. It remains unethically outward. But inwardly also, Iran is unethical in its treatment of its citizenry. And this is due to its totalitarian nature, which espouses a specific ideology, intolerant of other points of view whether it be from internal or external sources. In conclusion, there are no cooperative agreements in place with Iran, and Iran is unethical in its citizenry, as well as to the outside world. As such, Iran has no legitimate government in place. Thus, there are no ethical considerations in place to prohibit the U.S. from causing a cessation of Iran's nuclear program. As we are free to choose whether, we, whether to stop the Iran nuclear program, the philosophical angle, or we, the president, would consult our military leaders and then its allies in the Iran theater. Then the U.S., along with its allies, should they wish to join us, may use the necessary force to cause a cessation of the Iran nuclear program. This week, Mark, I'd like to start with you for your reaction, were you the president. Well, Chris, you mentioned that Iran doesn't have a, a legitimate government, but the last time they had a legitimate government, the United States didn't like that either. So I would, I would quote Henry Kissinger and say, you know, either we got to stop talking out of both sides of our mouth or get better at it. In 1953, when Iran elected Mohammad Mossadegh as its leader, we were fine with that until he decided to nationalize British Petro British, the, the, the assets of British Petroleum in Iran. And the British cried communism, which at that time was this synonymous with crying, say, terrorism today. And so we went and deposed Mossadegh and stuck in our puppet uh, the Shah Reza Pahlavi, and we know how that ended after his authoritarian rule for 25 years, and then Americans are taken hostage, and, and your average Amer at the embassy there, and your average American is watching TV saying, "Why, why do they hate us? What's going on? What was that all about?" And here we are today to to just fast forward it here. So, I'm a little bit, uh, you know, put yourself in Iran shoes for a minute. Iraq has fallen; their lifelong enemy has fallen. Pakistan has nukes, Israel has nukes, India has nukes. They've seen Iraq fall, they've seen Afghanistan fall. If you were an Iranian leader, would you or would you not think it prudent to pursue a nuclear path? True. Uh, Rick, your response? Well, uh, yeah, but I think, I think there's one slight difference, and that is, uh, my understanding is Iran's uh, known to be sponsoring terrorism actively promoting it uh, and I you could m possibly make the same argument with Pakistan uh, but certainly not with India for example uh, and to the extent that they are intent on pursuing an expanded effort in terrorism that certainly invites uh, an ever more aggressive response 
How come, how come when Ireland was sponsoring terrorism against England all throughout the 60s and 70s, nobody got so up in arms? I mean, f f for, for, under that rationale, we probably should have been bombing Boston with Ted Kennedy mailing money to the IRA. <laughs> well, I think there are certain Republican candidates who would agree. <laughs> yeah, I don't doubt that for a second. Uh, and, and Republican or Democrat, whoever wins, we're going into Iran. Uh, forget about just war theory. Chris, you didn't make you, you, your your idea for your kind of Jacobin regime change that you're proposing uh, did not touch at all on just war theory, which would have to be taken into account if we were to propose any kind of military action against Iran. But let's not let you know technicalities get in the way of a good idea for regime change. We we saw we've seen how successful regime change has been in Afghanistan, in Iraq, in Vietnam, and we do it so cheaply and with such little bloodshed. So do, if I understand you correctly, you're um you're for assisting in a regime change in Iran, uh, but not a military um, intervention. Is that is that? Do I discern your statements correctly? Uh, I basically follow uh, uh, realism in foreign policy. The strong do what they will; the weak accept what they must. And I look to defend the American national interest. Uh, you tell me what our national interest is, and I'll defend it. But what I don't think we should be doing is taking the sum of the special interests and calling that suddenly the national interests. So defending, say, other countries who might have a gripe with Iran, they should probably take that up with Iran. Iran poses no threat to the continent of the United States. The worst thing you could do would be mine the Persian Gulf. And when they do that, we'll take care of it, because there's an American national interest, the free flow of oil, that could be affected. But worrying about, you know, which country is fomenting terrorism, when I could point to 10 countries that are doing it, uh, hardly justifies us getting into another intractable morass that's going to bankrupt us further. You know, t take $15 trillion and double it. Um, so you're, you're, uh, you don't think that spo a state-sponsored uh, terrorism is really of any consequence to or concern to the United States. Is that correct? Uh, no, I, I, I oppose state-sponsored terrorism. Okay, and if a state does sponsor do, do I, do terrorism... I, do I think, you know, we, we have to look at proportionality here. Is a terrorist attack worth sending, you tell me, 500,000 American troops into Iran to avenge? Or could it be better done by taking out the third largest city in Iran with a nuclear bomb and saying, if you thought that was bad, wait to see what we do next time? Well, I don't think that the uh, military um, or, or this program purports that it is best to make an invasion of Iran, but uh, I think there are some other alternatives out there that uh, uh, that. Well, we should probably try diplomacy, but that, that's you know that's the uh, the neocon Jacobins would be aghast if anyone were to pro propose diplomatic channels. The diplomacy is like uh, the, the complaints you get from people who propose gun control. You know, they scream and yell every time there's a crime committed with a gun, but they ignore every single time that someone uses a crime, a gun to prevent a crime. So when diplomacy works, you don't read about it because there's no incident. So we don't, you know, so the neocons can't get all excited about it. They will get excited if there's an incident, though. Uh, Rick, any, uh, any response? Well, I, I would I would hasten to agree. I, I wouldn't envision invading Iran under any circumstances, and I I take the point that it's you know yet another potential entangling war that could last for years and cost the United States billions and billions. Uh, but I guess I, w I was just envisioning uh, bombing a nuclear facility if it became clear that the weapons might be used on either our allies uh, or uh, U.S. assets uh, in the Middle East. Uh, I, I would not endorse, by the way, having Israel undertake that because I think uh, that could be too easily uh, from a uh, propaganda perspective used against Israel and ourselves. I think any if any country were to undertake uh, attacking one of Iran's nuclear facilities if it proved that dangerous, and I'm not sure we've arrived there yet, uh, it would have to be the United States that takes the lead. 
Well, I, I agree, and uh, the, the, the purpose here today, or that, uh, that I particularly state myself, is that something must be done. I don't know that we could ever agree on here uh, what that needs to be, and certainly we're not military experts to know uh, uh, what our capabilities are in, in the fullest extent. But uh, I think we, something needs to be done first uh, against the nuclear facilities and also toward regime change. Mark, do you agree with that, Chris, with those Chris, two? Why, Chris, why, why would you, when Pakistan was harboring Osama bin Laden and Pakistan has nukes, when crimes, horrible atrocities are being committed daily in North Korea, where your average, the North Koreans are on average one foot shorter than South Koreans. Why do their nuclear arsenals not bother you? When, when, when North Korea is launching missiles to go across Japan, why are we not invading, taking out nuclear reactors, doing whatever it takes to stop those madmen regimes from doing their harm to the world? I agree with uh, that a regime change in North Korea and no, I, I, was, I was asking you why we're not doing it. You know, I'd also throw out, uh, before we get too fancy and too cocksure that we're going to just go and affect re regime change in Iran, China gets over 30% of its oil from Iran. Now, if anyone thinks outside of, say, the Heritage Foundation or whatever other SOFA samurai uh, organizations out there pounding the drums for water, if anyone thinks that China is just going to sit there and say, oh, please, please, have at it, do whatever you must with Iran, we'll go find our oil somewhere else, that's bad thinking, to put it mildly. Well, I don't think that um, perhaps uh, what Rick mentioned, uh, the surgical strike of, uh, of the nuclear facilities, would stop the flow of oil to China from Iran. And uh, well, you know, Chris, once, once we enter, once, once the bombs start flying, the fog of war comes, you don't know what's going to happen. To piss off, to potentially piss off your biggest creditor at this stage of the game, um, Obama might not get reelected. <laughs> I mean, if you think the economy is bad now, try it when China stops funding our debt. Right. So uh, why, why piss why piss off why piss off China? But to get back to your point of uh, uh, comparing North Korea to the problem of Iran, I equate them. Uh, I don't see any difference. Well, between my, my, well my question my question was. Why aren't you telling us we got to start doing regime change in North Korea tomorrow? I, 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 it, it is equivalent to Iran. Uh, it's just not okay. in the news. I'm actually, it is just not in the news on a daily basis as is Iran right now. And so that's the only reason why we don't title the, uh, the, the program, today's program, North Korea as opposed to Iran. There are 35,000 American soldiers within a stone's throw of the Korean nuclear weapons along the DMZ. Yes. Uh, nobody really cares about them. How about Pakistan? You know, why, why aren't you calling for regime change and tactical strikes against Pakistan's nukes? Uh, Pakistan I'm, is... I'm just, I'm, I'm just mystified by the fixation with Iran. Uh, because Iran is a totalitarian regime and is suspected to be very close to what history has shown us to be a bad situation as exhibited by the leaders of as we've mentioned, Castro, as are, as, are, as are both as are both North Korea and Pakistan. Who is harboring Osama bin Laden? Who is causing us immense problems in that area of the world? Pakistan. Yes. Uh, however, Pakistan has mitigating uh, circumstances which the other two countries do not have. They are a democracy. Um, uh, they we do have cooperative agreements in place, and they are cooperating with us. On, uh, on many fronts, but not 100%. And it's not 100% a satisfactory single, situation. To call the harboring of Osama bin Laden cooperation gives us a new definition of the word cooperation. Maybe we should do a show on the word cooperation. You can define it. That is, of course, an exception to what has been happening in, in Pakistan, but my point is... It's an, exception. it's an exception to such an extent, it's like, you know, aside from that, Mrs. Lincoln, what do you think of the show? Well, okay. We, I've ranted enough. It's Rick's turn. <laughs> okay, point well taken. However, uh, it's not to say that they, uh, Pakistan doesn't cooperate. They do cooperate. We do have uh, agreements in place. They are not a totalitarian regime. Uh, it, they, are, they are intractable on many points, uh, but 
it is it is not to the extent that uh, that Cuba, Iran, and North Korea are intractable and and have no cooperative agreements in place uh, with the free world. And yeah, so, yeah, funny about, I mean, let's, in, let's, in, let's invade Cuba. We got a lot of regime changing to do, Chris. Well, so the question is, do we put policies in place that that uh, facilitate regime play uh, uh, change? Do we put policies in place that facilitate a, 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 a deter or deter the building of nuclear facilities in these countries? And, and I feel, uh, because they are unethical and totalitarian regimes, that we need to. The question of what we do, to what extent those policies must, uh, must be forceful, is a different question. But it is clear that, at least in my mind, that something needs to change and that we ga gain a policy to clearly prevent these uh, 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 countries from gaining nuclear weapons and clearly facilitate the citizenry in gaining a, uh, freedom for themselves. And that's the, that's the point here. Rick, what? Uh, how do you feel about well, we this? Have, I, I, see, I see nuclear weapons. Well, I, I think we have to assume that. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I think we have to assume that uh, at some point Iran is going to perfect a nuclear weapon or several. And I think the issue really is, if it becomes clear they're going to use it uh, somewhere in the Middle East. Um, we need to send a, a signal very early on that we won't tolerate that and we're prepared to take action to prevent that from happening. Uh, and we will, that includes military options. Uh, now you're not going to announce right, you know, today we're planning to bomb you in the next month's time, but uh, there, there should be a, ser a clear sequence that the Iranians understand of actions that will lead to that result. There has to be a deterrent. Chris, one way we could start that sequence would be to have the Senate, because at present we are not bound by treaty to any country in the Middle East. What we could do is have the Senate bind us by treaty to the defense of a Middle Eastern country or two, which would send a clear signal to Iran. But I'd also throw out that historically nuclear weapons have been a stabilizing force, not a destabilizing force. I'm sorry, uh, Mark. Could you take? Could you give us that last statement again? Did you say it nuclear was... weapons? Nuclear weapons have had a stabilizing uh, effect on the geopolitical environment, and not a destabilizing one. Nuclear powers generally don't go to war. Nuclear powers with each other. That's true so far. Uh, where both countries have nuclear power, uh, of course, you have the Mad Doctrine and and others. Well, that brings me to a second question. Should the United States then develop its strategic uh, uh, missile uh, initiative that Reagan uh, initiated back in the 1980s? Should we follow through with that? Rick? Uh, I don't remember the cost of that program, but, but my understanding is it was enormous. Uh, and that was then. And today's dollars, God only knows how much it would cost. So uh, you're talking about Star Wars, obviously. That, and I think it would ha if if we were to have that kind of deterrent, it would have to be done on a cost-effective basis. Uh, otherwise, uh, these costs are going to bury us. Mark, yeah, Chris, and today, today there's probably, uh, you know. New union regulations that the that the uh, research required, diversity requirements, affirmative action things, they probably triple the cost of what it was when it was absurdly expensive back in the 80s. Well, uh, a cynical point of view. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, and uh, well taken, of course. And uh, But overall, do you think it should be uh, pursued? Mark? I, I just, you know, Chris, I, I think that's a little bit of just pie in the sky. You're looking for a panacea. Uh, it would be nice if we had it but I wouldn't sit here and say, you know what, we're just gonna spend a lot of money on Star Wars and that'll fix this problem. This has to be a multi-pronged approach and 
diplomacy should be leading the way. When diplomacy fails, that's when you start getting aggressive. Because once diplomacy fails, then just war theory says that such actions as military reprisals are ethically okay. Has uh, diplomacy failed in the uh, uh, with uh, in terms of Iran? Uh, when was the last diplomatic overture that either country made to each to each other? I mean. Uh, Ahmadinejad embarrassed Morley Safer on 60 Minutes. He came over here and ranted at the UN. But how about a high-level meeting between our Secretary of State and whatever other uh, person in Iran represents that role? When was the last time that happened? Yeah, not, not that I want our current Secretary of State going over and negotiating anything, but it's all we've got at this point. Well, uh, it doesn't seem that that's right. It doesn't seem to be much going on, and uh, and certainly our State Department is uh, is always in, uh, and Obama himself has declared that uh, diplomacy is needed here. Um, uh, and in the midst of, and in, in reaction to that, we have the uh, the attempted assassination uh, of uh, the uh, Saudi uh, statesman here uh, a couple of months ago. Um, yeah, which is which is an absurd kind of red herring to bring in. Uh, you know, let's point to where diplomacy worked, uh, preventing the Ar Armageddon that would have been the Cuban Missile Crisis. Uh, Rick, do you have any uh, any further thoughts? Well, we have about look, I think I think there, there, there are two c conditions required to take military action vis-a-vis -vis Iran. Uh, I, I, I fully uh, support the idea of, you know, continuing diplomatic efforts, but there has to be an imminent threat, one, and two, there has to be support from our allies in the Middle East. I mean, it doesn't make sense to do this, quote unquote, on our own. I presume we would have the support of Saudi Arabia and a number of other countries with whom we have to work cooperatively in the Middle East to keep that tinderbox under control, at least you know until it's no longer so explosive. Uh, and God only knows when that will be. But I'm assuming we would if there was an imminent threat, we would be working hand-in-hand uh, hand with our various allies out in the Middle East, and they would actually be coming to us and saying, look, something needs to be done about this. Good point. And that's all we have uh, for today on The Philosophical Angle. Thanks for viewing, and we'll see you next week. Thank you. Thank you, guys.